As you notice, the title of our study this evening is Fire, Lions, and Deliverance. It's actually part two that we began in our last study. And so before we begin our study, we want to ask for the Lord's blessing as we open the pages of his holy book. So please uh, bow your heads with me as we pray. Our Father and our God, uh, we come boldly to the throne of grace because we come in the name of Jesus. First of all, we want to thank you for having been with us throughout the first nine studies together. And uh, now, as we are about to end this series, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit through the ministry of the angels in a very special way. We ask, Lord, that you will open our minds and our hearts to receive the seed of truth, that you will give us the boldness to speak the truth as it is in Jesus. We thank you, Father, for all of those who are watching the live streaming, for those who will watch this on YouTube. Bless them and open their minds and hearts as well. And I thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, for I ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> well, let's begin by reviewing the prophetic chain that we have been pursuing during the last nine sessions. You have this on your handout, and I, I want to take this opportunity of mentioning to those who will be watching this on the live streaming as well as on YouTube, that uh, there is a syllabus available where these lectures are in printed form so that you can visualize what we're discussing here. Uh, those who have attended have received a handout with the full lecture. So I would encourage those who are watching the live stream and also those who will be watching on YouTube, those who get the DVDs, that you will uh, also get the syllabus that goes along with the class. Now let's review the prophetic chain. We have first of all Babylon, 605 to 539 B.C. Then we have Medo-Persia, 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. Then we have the Kingdom of Greece, 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. Then we have the Roman Empire, which is a united empire, from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. And then the Roman Empire is divided. And the divisions take place primarily uh, between the year 476 and the year 538. And then after the Roman Empire is divided, you have a little horn which represents the Roman Catholic papacy. And this little horn rules for 1,260 years. And the 1,260 years come to an end in the year 1798 where the papacy was put under restraint and the papacy received the wound with the sword of civil power. And then around the same time that uh, this uh, little horn received its deadly wound, we find that another beast rises from the earth. And this beast from the earth, as we've studied, represents the United States of America, a beast that has two horns like a lamb, but ends up speaking like a dragon. Now, where are we in the prophetic chain? Right now, we are in the period of respite where there is no persecution. Right now, we are living in the closing stages of the papacy being restrained and having the wound of the sword. I firmly believe that as we see what's happening in the United States, in Rome, what is happening uh, in the United Nations, etc., that we are in the last portion of this period of respite, this period of peace. The next event on the drama, according to what we studied, will be when this beast from the earth that has two horns like a lamb, and of course that represents a civil and religious liberty, which is based on the foundation of the separation of church and state, what is going to happen is that this beast from the earth is going to end up contradicting its profession, and it is going to speak like a dragon. In other words, it's going to professedly say that it believes in religious liberty and civil liberty, in the separation of church and state, but in the actual practice, it will deny what it claims to believe and to practice. So we are now uh, in the time immediately before the deadly wound is healed and the papacy is released from its captivity. And then we noticed the three events that we studied 
in our first part last night. And that is, after all cases are decided in the judgment, then the close of human probation will take place. There will be no more opportunity to change sides. And then after this, there will be a time of trouble such as never has been seen in the history of the world. God will have withdrawn His Spirit from the earth, and the heart of man can be very cruel when it is devoid of the Spirit of God. And then finally, the time of trouble will come to an end. The time of trouble for God's people will come to an end when Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven with all of His holy angels to deliver His remnant from the death decree that has been proclaimed against them. That is the prophetic chain that we find in Scripture. This is not an invention of mine. We have carefully studied all of these events. Now, let's review a few details about the beast with lamb-like horns that speaks like a dragon. We have clearly identified this power as the United States of America. We noted that the two horns represent civil and religious liberty, which is based on the idea of church and state being separate from one another. The church would be religious liberty and the state would be civil liberty. Now, these principles of the separation of church and state are clearly enunciated in the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. These principles of civil and religious liberty, separation of church and state, are found in the First Amendment. In other words, the two horns, like a lamb, are in one of the founding documents of the United States. Now, you remember that we studied that this beast from the earth is going to do everything in its power to restore the throne to the beast that, was, that received the deadly wound to the beast that was sent into captivity. Let me just review the main points. We notice that this beast from the earth will speak like a dragon, and we've noticed that the dragon represents Satan working through what power? Satan working through Rome. We also notice that this beast from the earth will exercise all of the power of the first beast. We notice that it will do everything in the presence of the first beast. Basically, in the presence of means on behalf of the first beast. It will command everyone to worship the first beast. It will make an image of the first beast. And it will enforce the mark of the first beast. So you notice that this second beast, this beast from the earth representing the United States is actually going to be instrumental in returning freedom to the papacy from its captivity and restoring the sword of civil power to the papacy. And we are seeing signs that that is happening in our very day. We are reminded of the first two clauses of the First Amendment to the Constitution. The first two clauses of the First Amendment have to do with religious liberty. The last clause of the First Amendment has to do with civil liberty. Let's notice, uh, first of all, the first two clauses of the First Amendment to the Constitution. This is how it reads. Congress shall make no law. Congress draws up the laws, doesn't it? Congress shall make no law respecting what? an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In other words, the First Amendment to the Constitution pro, uh, prohibits Congress from writing a law that establishes any religious observance. And it forbids Congress from drawing up any law that forbids people from practicing freely their religion. One is called the Establishment Clause, the other is called the Free Exercise Clause. So basically what this means is that Congress could never write a law that enforces Sunday observance or forbids the observance of the Sabbath because it would be establishing Sunday and it would be forbidding the free exercise of keeping the Sabbath. And yet the prophecy tells us that the United States, even though it's going to conserve the two uh, first clauses of the First Amendment is going to contradict them in actual practice. Now, not only do we have in the First Amendment a guarantee of religious liberty by forbidding Congress to establish religion 
or to forbid the free exercise of religion, but the First Amendment also guarantees what the other horn represents. It guarantees full civil liberty. Notice clause number three of the First Amendment. It continues saying, I'm going to read the First Amendment in its entirety now, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or, now comes the civil rights, or abridging the freedom of speech. Is that a civil right? It most certainly is. Or of the press. Is a free press a civil right? It certainly is. Or the right of the people peaceably to assemble. Is that a civil right? Yes. And to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Basically that means that if somebody does you an injustice, you have a right to appeal to the government for the government to do you justice and to set things right. Is that a civil right? It most certainly is a civil right. So the First Amendment to the Constitution guarantees religious liberty and it guarantees what? Civil liberty. So let me ask you, is there a separation between church and state in the First Amendment? Yes, because Congress is forbidden from making religious laws, whether establishing religion or practicing the free exercise of religion. Are you with me or not? Now, in our last study, oh, by the way, let me mention this before we talk a little bit about our last study. If Congress should write a law enforcing Sunday observance and prohibiting the observance of the Sabbath, let me ask you, would that affect your civil rights? Would that affect your freedom of speech? What would the government do if you speak out against that? You would be persecuted. Would that affect your right to publicize by television and by radio and by newspapers, etc., your views contrary to the views of the law? Absolutely. Would that affect your freedom of assembly on the Holy Sabbath? You would be forced to attend church on Sunday. Would it also have anything to do with the government saying, we are not going to redress your grievances because you're persecuted for not keeping Sunday? Let me ask you, when the first two clauses of the First Amendment are violated, is the third clause also violated? It is. When the government gets involved in religion, ultimately people lose also their civil rights, which is the third clause of the First Amendment. I hope you're understanding the importance of this. Now let's look at the common denominators of what we studied last time. We notice that in all the perspectives that we have of the close of probation, the tribulation, and the second coming of Christ, the deliverance of God's people, we have six common denominators. First of all, we have a faithful remnant. Secondly, we have enemies of the remnant. Number three, the remnant goes through a severe time of trouble because of the persecution of their enemies. During this time of trouble, the faith of the remnant is what? Severely tested. Does God immediately answer the pleas of His people for deliverance? No, there's a delay in God intervening to deliver. But ultimately, finally, after the delay, God what? God intervenes and He delivers His people. And we noticed several examples of that last night. But now we want to take a look at a few other stories that illustrate this same sequence of events. And we want to take a look at Daniel chapter 3. And we're not going to study everything in Daniel chapter 3. We don't have the time to do that. But what I want you to see as we study Daniel 3 is what happens when the civil power establishes religion. So this story is going to illustrate what happens when the first clause of the First Amendment is violated. Immediately the result is persecution. When the civil power gets involved in enforcing religious observances, the result is automatically, ultimately, persecution. Daniel 3, in other words, is a vivid illustration of what happens when the civil power violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment to the Constitution. Now Daniel 3 is really a small-scale model of what is going to happen at the end of time. It's a local, literal model of something that is going to hap happen globally and spiritually at the end of time. Let me ask you, did Nebuchadnezzar for a while live as a beast? Yes, for seven years he lived as a beast. Let me ask you, did he raise an image? 
he raised an image. Was that image in honor of himself and of his kingdom? Of course it was. Did he command everyone to worship the image? He most certainly did. Did he give a death decree against all of those who would not worship the image? Does that sound familiar? Have you ever read Revelation 13? You must have because you've been coming to our studies here. In Revelation 13, do you have a beast? Yes. Does the beast raise up an image? It does. Does it command everyone to worship the image of the beast? Absolutely. Does it say that whoever does not worship the image of the beast will be killed? Absolutely. But in Daniel 3, you're dealing with a literal small geographical area. You're dealing with literal Babylon. You're dealing with the literal Jews. At the end of time, you're dealing with spiritual Babylon, which is global. And God's people are not just three individuals. It's all of God's remnant people on a global basis, on a worldwide basis. Are you understanding the principle? Now, let's take a look at this story of Daniel 2. Go with me to Daniel chapter 3 and verse 15. You all know that Nebuchadnezzar raised an image. He commanded everyone to worship the image on pain of death. And... Uh, there were three young men, that's the remnant, that said, we will not worship the image that has been raised by the beast, so to speak. And so the king gets very furious. And know what, notice what he says in Daniel 3, verse 15. The key word that we're going to see is deliver. Don't forget, deliver. Remember Daniel 12, verse 1? At that time, when God's people are being persecuted by the king of the north, Michael stands up to protect them. It says, and God's people will be what? delivered everyone who is found written in the book. Now, remember that word because Daniel 3 and Daniel 6 illustrate Daniel 12, verse 1. Daniel 12, verse 1 is the global fulfillment of Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. Now, notice verse 15. The king says, But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And now notice the question that he asks. And who is the God who will what? Who will deliver you from my hands? Is the word deliver a key word? Oh, the beast raises his image and he gives a decree to worship. He says, and if you don't worship, what God is going to deliver you from my hands? Now, it's interesting to notice the answer of the young uh, Hebrew worthies. We find it in verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to... There's the key word again. Used only in three chapters in Daniel. Daniel 3, Daniel 6, and Daniel 12, verse 1. They must be connected. So, notice, it says... If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will what? There's the word again. He will deliver us from your hand, O king. But they're not presumptuous. They love the Lord so much that they're willing to give up their lives. So they say, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Is the remnant in jeopardy? They're very much in jeopardy. Are they facing a death decree? Most certainly so, because the civil power has established a religious observance. Are these individuals doomed to lose the greatest civil right, which is life? Absolutely. Now, I want you to notice Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. Someone comes into the furnace to deliver these young men. Notice Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. King Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace, and suddenly he sees not three but four. It says there, look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You'll notice that some modern versions say the Son of the Gods, like, the, like he thought that this was one of many gods. No. The fact is the spirit of prophecy tells us that Daniel had described to Nebuchadnezzar the, the, what the Son of God looked like. And Nebuchadnezzar knew that this was not simply a son of one of the gods. It was the Son of God. But now I want you to notice something very interesting. Who delivers in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1? 
It is Michael who delivers. And what is Michael? He is the ark angel who delivers. Now, even though it says here that the one who is in the furnace is the Son of God, I want you to notice verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, this is after they come out of the furnace, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel. Now, wait a minute. What was the Son of God? The angel. Which angel? Michael, the archangel. Are you with me or not? It's the same Jesus that delivered in the furnace that will deliver according to Daniel 12 verse 1 at the end of time. So it says he sent his angel and notice the word, delivered his servants who trusted in him. Notice, trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. So now Nebuchadnezzar makes an illegitimate decree. Nebuchadnezzar is going to say, now everybody's going to have to worship, everybody's going to have to respect the God of these three young men. And if they don't, they're going to be chopped in pieces and their houses are going to be to totally torn down. Was that a legitimate decree? No, the civil power cannot forbid you from worshiping the true God, nor can it force you to worship false gods. It cannot be involved in religion. Now notice what the king says in Daniel 3 verse 28. And we'll read verse uh, 29 as well. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now notice this. Who sent his angel and what? What's the key word again? And delivered his servants who trusted in him. Notice that the idea is that they trusted implicitly in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Now notice he gives a decree. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall made a, be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. What do you think is the key word in this whole passage? Deliver. Deliver. God is a God who delivers His remnant from certain death. His remnant whose faith is severely tested. Now notice Hebrews 11, 33 and 34. What was the secret of these three young men? Why were they so firm and so constant? Notice, you notice that we already read that they trusted their God. That means they had faith in God. Notice Hebrews 11, 33 and 34 picks up on this. It gives a long list of the heroes of faith. And then we find these words. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me, to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Now notice what they did. Who through faith, that means trust by the way, who through faith subdued kingdom, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the what? By faith they stopped the mouths of lions and by faith they did what else? They quenched the violence of fire. So what did these three young men have when they went through this trial over the beast, his image, and the command to worship and the death decree? They trusted their God. They had faith in their God, according to this. And they tamed the fire, and they shut the lion's mouths. Now, do we have all of the common denominators in this story? Is there a faithful remnant? Yes, yes the three young men. Are there enemies of the remnant? Absolutely, the king and his advisors. Does the remnant go through a severe time of trouble? Yes, they do. Did they face a death decree? Was it a real anguishing trial for them? It most certainly was. Now, did God delay in delivering them? Could God have delivered them without them being thrown into the furnace? Did God delay in delivering them? Oh, you know why? Because when they were, if, if they had not been thrown into the furnace, the whole Babylonian kingdom would not have seen how great God was in delivering them. So God is going to allow His people to go through the time of trouble at the end of time so that His glory will shine when He finally delivers His people from certain death. Let me ask you, were they delivered after the period of delay? They were, were most certainly delivered. Now let's go to another story in the book of Daniel that illustrates the second clause of the First Amendment. 
the case of when the free exercise of religion is forbidden. You see, in Daniel 6, we have a similar story to Daniel 3. But it's not the king establishing religion. It's the king forbidding the free exercise of religion, which is the second clause of the First Amendment to the Constitution. Let's notice, first of all, what the controversy is about. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 5. You remember that there's a text in the book of Revelation that says that the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who what? Who keep the commandments of God. The final conflict is between obedience to God's commandments and disobedience to God's commandments and worshiping God or worshiping the beast. So is the conflict at the end time the law and worship? Absolutely. Now notice what we find in Daniel 6 verse 5. Then these men, the advisors of the king, said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning what? Concerning the law of his God. This guy keeps God's law, and we've got to come after him because of that. Now notice verses 7 through 9. Here is where the king makes a law. By the way, he's accepting the counsel of his advisors. See, in these stories, the advisors are the dangerous ones because they're deceiving the civil power into doing this. And the kings of the earth today would, would do well to listen to what I'm saying right now because the religious system of the papacy appears to want the best for the kings of the world. But let me tell you, folks, the papacy wants simply to take over the throne of the power of the world again. They do not have any love for the civil powers of the world, no matter how much the civil powers of the world think that the papacy does. So it says, all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree, they're speaking to the king, that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. He says, boy, these guys really do love me. Nobody can, can ask any petition of a man or a god for 30 days. Let me ask you, is the king establishing a religious observance? No, he isn't. He's forbidding the right of people to petition their God. He's forbidding the free exercise of religion. Are you with me or not? He's not established saying, you have to pray this way. No, he's saying, you can't pray for a period of 30 days to any God. It's the, uh, it's the second clause of the First Amendment. It's forbidding the free exercise of religion. Now, what did Daniel do when the decree was given forbidding him to pray to his God? Notice what it says in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with the windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. It would have been very easy for Daniel to say, now you know, there's no reason to ruffle these guys' feathers. There's no reason to really aggravate them. You know, I'll just shut the windows. No way. He was not politically correct. He says, this is an illegitimate decree. By the way, Daniel obeyed all of the civil laws of the Medes and Persians, except when the Medes and Persians proclaimed a law that violated his con their conscience or his conscience. Are you with me or not? So we should obey all of the civil laws, except when the civil law conflicts with our religious convictions. And so it says that Daniel prayed. And of course, his enemies were watching. Notice Daniel chapter 6, verse 14 to 23. Oh, these men go and tell the king, Oh, king, we found Daniel praying to him, you know, practicing his religion. And you said that, uh, that nobody could uh, freely practice their religion. So, uh, you know, you have to enforce the law. Verse 14. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. Did he realize that he'd been deceived? Oh, yeah, but it was too late. And set his heart to, on Daniel to what? Oh, there's the key word, to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. 
But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will... Wow, I think deliverance is a central theme here. So he says, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually. See, there you have the element of faith, trust in God. The God whom you serve continually. Has he been able to what? There it is again, to deliver you from the lions. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his what? <laughs> so who is it that delivers? Michael, the archangel. In the fiery furnace, the angel. With Jacob, remember the story of Jacob? The angel who is God, by the way. So it's the angel who delivers. And so, it, so he says, um, once again, verse uh, 20. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, All king, live forever. My God sent his angels and shut the lions' mouths so that, they, so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. I have been, I have been trustworthy before God and before the civil power. Verse 23, Now the king was exceedingly glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up, up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him. Now notice what is the reason. Because he what? Because he believed in his God. He trusted, he had faith in this trial. I want you to remember this. We'll come back to it. And now King Darius gives a decree which is illegitimate again. But these are pagan kings. See, they're doing the best according to the knowledge that they have. Notice verse 25. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. And now notice this. He what? There it is again. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has? I think deliverance is a central thought, right? So it says, who has delivered Daniel from what? From the power of the lions. So let me ask you, is there a faithful remnant in this story? Who is it? Daniel. Does he have enemies? Oh, the advisors of the king primarily. Does Daniel go through a time of trouble? You don't think being thrown into a lion's den is a time of trouble? <laughs> Hungry lions, because the Bible says that, that the ones that planned the plot were thrown into the lion's den, and before they got to the bottom of the den, the lions were having the back banquet of the century. So they were very hungry. It was a trial of Daniel's faith to stand for God and to know that he would be thrown into the lion's den. Let me ask you, did God delay in delivering Daniel? He delayed all night, folks. But did God ultimately intervene and deliver Daniel from his enemies? Absolutely. Now let's take a look at the book of Esther. Very interesting book. The crisis, once again, has to do with law and worship. That is the conflict at the end of time. Folks, it is not ISIS. That is a distraction. Everybody's looking over at ISIL, you know, and the terrorists. I'm not saying that terrorism is okay or blowing yourself up is okay. That's a, that's a barbarous act. But what I'm saying is that prophecy is not being fulfilled over there. Prophecy is being fulfilled in Rome and in the United States. And people can't see it because they're looking there instead of looking here. Now, what is the issue in the days of Esther? Esther 3, verses 1 to 3. It involves worship. After these things, King Ahasuerus prompted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid 
homage to Haman. Now, why did they pay homage to Haman? Why did they bow before him? For so the king had commanded concerning him. Is this a civil power giving a command to bow before a human being? Absolutely. Was Mordecai a faithful Jew? He most certainly was. So notice what it continues saying. But Mordecai would not what? Bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? So let me ask you, is, uh, is Mordecai violating civil law? Yes. Does the civil law say bow before this human being? Yes. Does Mordecai disobey the civil law? Yes, because it conflicts with what? It conflicts with the convictions of his conscience. And when the civil power makes laws that conflict with your conscience, you have a right to disobey the civil law. But otherwise, you must obey civil law. Only when it interferes with your religious convictions are you entitled to disobey. Now, when Haman discovers that Mordecai does not bow before him, he is filled with rage. And he says, I'm not only going to get rid of Mordecai, I'm going to get rid of the whole people, all of the Jews. Notice what we find in Esther chapter 3 and uh, verses 8 and 9. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Now notice what the issue is. They're what? Oh, talking about the, the, the Jewish nation. Their laws are different from all other peoples. And because their laws are different, what, what law would it be referring to? Bowing and rendering homage, right? Worship. And so it says here, their laws are different than all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be what? That they be destroyed. Are you catching the picture? Now, is there a faithful remnant in this story? Who is the faithful remnant? Mordecai and the Jews. Do they have enemies? Haman and his wife. We don't have time to talk about his wife. But his wife was the real mover behind the scenes. Does, uh, does Mordecai and do the people go through a severe time of trouble and crisis? Let's read about it in Esther chapter 4 and verse 3. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great what? Mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Can you hear the anguish and the agony of the people as they're going through this time of trouble when a death decree has been proclaimed against them? Is the faith of God's people severely tested during this trial? Absolutely. Did God delay to intervene to deliver them? All you have to do is read the story of Esther. God could have delivered them instantly. But there's a whole series of events that take place. While the death decree has been given, there's all kinds of events that God takes to finally deliver His people. He does not deliver them instantly. But let me ask you, does He finally intervene and deliver His people from certain death? Let me read you this statement from Ellen White. She stated in Volume 5 of that, that Testimonies, page 450, the decree which is to go forth against the people of God at the end time will be very similar to that issued by Ahasuerus against the Jews in the time of Esther. Do we need to study the book of Esther then? Oh, absolutely. The Persian edict sprang from the malice of Haman toward Mordecai. Not that Mordecai had done him harm, but he had refused to show him reverence, which belongs only to God. Was this an issue of worship? It most certainly was. The king's decision against the Jews was secured under false pretenses through misrepresentation of that peculiar people. Are God's people going to be misrepresented at the end of time? You just read the Bible and read what the spirit of prophecy has to say about the end time. She continues writing, Satan instigated the scheme in order to rid the earth of those who preserve the knowledge of the true God. But 
His plots were defeated by a counter power that reigns among the children of men. Angels that excel in strength were commissioned to protect the people of God and the plots of their adversaries returned upon their own heads. And then she makes the application. The Protestant world today see in the little company keeping the Sabbath a Mordecai at the gate. His character and conduct expressing reverence for the law of God are a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling upon His Sabbath. The unwelcome intruder must by some means be put out of the way. Are you catching the picture? So let me ask you, are all of the elements that we've been speaking about found in this story? Absolutely. You know the most beautiful part of all these stories is the final deliverance. God has the last word. He delivers those who have faith in Him, those who trust in Him. But the greatest example in the Bible of these elements that we've spoken about is the experience of Jesus. The experience of Jesus has all of these common denominators that we've described. The faithful remnant in this case would be Jesus Christ. At the end of his life, did Jesus Christ have very many enemies that wanted to do him in? Oh, we can just mention Satan. We can mention Judas. We can mention Caiaphas, the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Herodians, who instigated the populace to try and get rid of Jesus. Did Jesus go through a severe time of trouble and anguish because of the persecution of his enemies? Absolutely. Notice Matthew chapter 26 and verse 37. Jesus, when he's in Gethsemane, he says, My soul is exceedingly what? Sorrowful even to death. And you remember that in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times he raised up a prayer to his father. He said, Father, if this cup of your wrath can pass from me because I have to drink this cup of your wrath because I'm bearing the sins of the world. If this cup of your wrath can pass away, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. And the Bible says that he sweated great drops of blood because of the anguish and the time of trouble that he was going through. And then Jesus, when he was on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the time of trouble of Jesus. By the way, this time of trouble is described vividly in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. Here it says the following, Who in the days of his flesh... When he had offered up prayers and supplications. This is what is happening in Gethsemane. He had offered up prayers and supplications with what? With vehement cries and tears to him he was who was able to save him from death was heard because of his godly fear. Ellen White describes the anguish of Jesus and how Jesus was able to gain the victory in this terrible time of trouble. She writes in Desire of Ages, page 756, Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, He had relied upon what? Upon the evidence of His Father's acceptance heretofore given to Him. In other words, He had a past experience that strengthened Him in this trial. He was acquainted with the character of His Father. He understood His justice, His mercy, and His great love. By faith, He rested in Him, whom it had ever been His joy to obey. And as in submission, He committed Himself to God. The sense of the loss of His Father's favor was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was what? Was the victor. Jesus did not depend on His feelings and His emotions. In his time of trouble. He felt separated from his father. He felt the burden of sin. He thought that the burden of sin was so heavy. That he would never see his father's face again. And yet he trusted in the promises of his father. This is what the Bible calls the faith of Jesus. Let me ask you. Was there a delay in the father intervening to deliver Jesus? Did Jesus die? Yes or no? Of course he died. Did his father deliver him from death? No, there was a delay. Did the father deliver him from death ultimately? 
Yes, but there was a delay. I want you to notice what we find in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. Why did God allow Jesus to go through this severe trial? It says in Hebrews 5 verse 8, the very next verse after what we've just read. Though he was what? A son, he learned what? Obedience by the things which he suffered. So what happens when we go through this trial? We learn to obey, to trust God, to have faith in God, to have implicit trust in God so that nothing in the world can shake our trust in Him. Let me ask you, even though there was a delay and it looked like God didn't answer Jesus because He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then He died. So there's a delay. How long did the delay last? <laughs> it lasted from uh, Friday afternoon at about 3 o'clock till very early on the first day of the week. So after the delay, is Jesus going to be delivered by His Father? Absolutely. Notice this statement from Ellen White. It's found in Youth's Instructor, May 2, 1901. It says there, He who died for the sins of the world was to remain in the tomb for the allotted time. He was in that stony prison house, a prisoner of divine justice. Wow. He was in the tomb, a prisoner of divine justice. And he was responsible to the judge of the universe. Who was the judge of the universe? God the Father. He was bearing the sins of the world, and his Father only could release him. What would be a synonym of release? Deliver. deliver. That's right. Only his Father could deliver him. And I know some people are thinking about John 10, 17 and 18 where Jesus says, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take up my life again. Pro trouble is people don't read the complete two verses. Let's notice John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Therefore my Father loves me, Jesus says, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. So He lays down His life and He takes it again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of myself. And then he says, I have power. That's a bad translation. It's, the word, it's not the word dunamis, where we get the word dynamite from. It's the word exousia, which really should be translated authority. He's saying, I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. Why did Jesus have authority to lay down his life and take it up again? Was it because of him, or was it because he got permission from his Father? Let's read the last part of verse 18. This command I have received from my Father. So what happened on the first day of the week, Jesus was a prisoner of divine justice. The Father sends down two angels. One of them rolls away the stone and sits on the stone. And the other angel stands before the tomb and says, O thou Son of God, thy Father calls thee. And then Jesus comes forth from the tomb by a life that is within himself. But his Father was the one that authorized Jesus to take up his own life again. He says, I receive this command from my Father. So was Jesus delivered by his Father? He most certainly was delivered. That's the beautiful thing. Now, do you know that we are going to repeat the story of Jesus? Listen to this magnificent statement, Review and Herald, April 14, 1896. This uh, actually gives you goosebumps gives me. The forces of the powers of darkness will unite with human agents who have given themselves unto the control of Satan. And the same scenes, listen, the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. Are we going to go through a similar trial? Yes. And notice what it's going to be like. Through yielding to satanic influences, men will be merged into fiends. That means demons. And those who were created in the image of God, who were formed to honor and glorify their creator, will become the habitation of dragons. And Satan will see in an apostate race his masterpiece of evil, men who reflect his own image. That's what God's people are going to go through. That's why... I can assure you that Jesus is not going to simply pick up and leave. The Spirit will be withdrawn from the finally impenitent, but the Spirit will not be withdrawn from God's people because nobody would survive. 
So let me ask you, is there going to be a generation at the end of time that we can call the faithful generation? Absolutely. Revelation 13 verse 10 says, Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the what? The faith of Jesus. And in Revelation chapter 13, and that was 14, 12, Revelation 13 verse 10 says, Here is the patience of the saints. And then it speaks about those who keep the commandments of God, and here is the perseverance or the patience of the saints. Now, the big question is, why will God allow His people to go through this severe time of trouble? Why not just spare them and take them out of the world before the tribulation like most Christians believe? I believe the best explanation is found in the story of Job. You remember the story of Job? There was this council in heaven. All the representatives of the universe came to present themselves before the Lord. And, of course, Satan came representing planet Earth because before Jesus uh, died on the cross, Satan was the prince of this world. Jesus said, but he's going to be cast out when I die. And so, uh, you know, God says proudly to Satan, you know, where do you come from? Well, I come from the earth, you know, from patrolling my territory. And God says, have you seen my servant Job? He lives in your territory, but, but uh, he's my servant. And the devil says, oh, of course, he's your servant. You've surrounded him. You protect him. You've prospered him. You don't allow me to touch him. But if you allowed me to touch him, you would see that he serves you for the loaves and the fishes. He serves you be out of self-interest. He doesn't serve you because he loves you. So if you let me try him, he would blaspheme you to your face. Now what would have happened if God had said, ah, oh, don't believe him, he's a liar, if he'd said that before the heavenly council? The heavenly council would say, well, who knows? So God says to Satan, go for it. Do whatever you want. Take whatever you want from him. So you know the story. The devil goes out and he takes everything from Job. All of his material possessions are gone. And after the trial, he says, God gave and God has taken away. He was half right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> he did not sin against God. He did not blaspheme against God. So is the devil looking pretty bad before the heavenly council? Before all the representatives of the world? Oh, he's looking bad. God is looking good. See, Job serves God even when God doesn't, you know, when God has withdrawn his protection. So a second meeting takes place in heaven. And God says, have you seen my servant Job? You know, how in spite of the fact you, you turned me against him, he still conserves his integrity. Ah, oh, the devil says, of course you didn't let me touch him. If you let me touch him, you would see that he serves you for the loaves and the fishes out of self-interest. And God could have, could have said, no, you've seen, he's a liar. The heavenly council might have thought, well, you know, maybe he's got a point. So God says, go afflict him. I won't let you kill him because if you kill him, the trial's over. But do whatever you want to him, only don't kill him. So the devil goes out and he afflicts Job with a terrible boils, terrible boils from the top of his head to the plant of his foot. He had to scratch himself with a potsherd. Then his wife forsakes him. His wife says, curse God and die. That's what the devil had said. She becomes an instrument of the devil. And then his three friends come to console Job and they become his accusers. Everything has turned against Job. He's going through this severe, terrible time of trouble. He's lost all of his possessions. He's lost the support of his wife. He's lost the support of his friends. He's lost his health. He's, the, the nation spit in his face. You can read this in the book. All of, the, all of those who previously loved him now hate him. There's no one. And if you read beginning with chapter 3 all the way through chapter 38, you'll find that Job feels that like even God has forsaken him. All throughout those chapters, from chapter 3 to chapter 38, Job is saying, where are you? I know that if I could come to your throne, to your, to your throne of justice, you would do justice. You would hear my case and you would vote on, uh, in my favor. What is happening to me? I was faithful. I used my goods to help the poor. I was a family man. I had wor family worship with my kids. What is happening? Why have you, my best friend, forsaken me? And God's answer is silence. Is there a delay in this story? The delay is from chapter 3 to chapter 38. And then finally, God has heard enough. And so in chapter 38, he says to Job, now you be quiet, I'm going to talk. And then God begins to describe his greatness in creation in chapters 39 and 40. And I have to go quickly because our time is almost up. In chapter 41, God shows Job a creature called Leviathan. 
which is, which is described in Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1, as the serpent and the dragon. In other words, Leviathan was the one that was causing all of Job's problems. And Job now says, ah, now I know where all this suffering came from. It's not because of you. And so Job says, I repent in dust and ashes for requiring that you should answer and explain the reason for my suffering. And the Bible says that God gave Job twice as much as what he had before. Let me ask you, who looked good in this whole story? God looked good. It is God who is being accused. Does Job vindicate God? He most certainly does. The heavenly universe says Job serves God because he loves God and he trusts God. No matter how many evils may come, God is right and Satan is wrong. God will allow his people to go through the time of trouble to make a great statement to the universe, and that is God has a people who say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. People like the three young men who said, even if you throw us in the furnace and we're burned alive, we are still servants of the true God. The universe will see that it is possible to be loyal to God because you love God without any self-interest. There's a second reason. And that is that the character of Job was refined in the trial. In Job 23 and verse 10, Job said, When he, God has tried me, I shall come forth as what? As gold. Isaiah 48 verse 10 says, Behold, God is speaking, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the what? In the furnace of affliction. Ellen White picks up on this. She says, the affliction is great, those who are going through the time of trouble. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them. She's referring to Daniel 3. But the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity. But it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. And so, folks, in these times of relative peace is when we need to learn to trust God because the big trials are coming. And if we are not strong in our faith with God now, we will never be firm in the time of trouble that is soon to come. Mm -hmm.